the national debate, live and in color from Confederation Hall in the West Block of the Parliament Buildings in Ottawa. This is a joint production of the CBC and CTV Networks and Radio Canada. Bonsoir, ici Pierre Nadeau. And I'm Charles Templeton. On June 25th, Canadians go to the polls to elect a government. To assist the electorate in their understanding of the issues before the nation, the CTV and CBC networks have combined to present the national debate. The participants are the Prime Minister, the Right Honourable Pierre Trudeau, leader of the Liberal Party, the Honourable Robert Stanfield, leader of the Progressive Conservative Party, Mr. T.C. Douglas, leader of the New Democratic Party, and Mr. Rial Cahuet, leader of the Réunion Créditiste. Now, the rules of the debate are simple and have been agreed to by all concerned. Each speaker will make an opening statement of three minutes' duration. This will be followed by a series of questions unknown to the participants by our panel of broadcast journalists. Now, the speaker to whom a question has put has two minutes for his reply. His opponents have one and a half minutes for comment or rebuttal. On each speaker's desk is a small light. It will turn on when he has 30 seconds to go. When his time has expired, the light will blink on and off. After approximately 80 minutes, Mr. Cowett will join the debate under the rules just outlined. Pierre? Now let me outline the rule in French. Les participants ont accepté les règles de ce débat. Elles sont simples. En premier lieu et à tour de rôle, les chefs de parti se livreront à un énoncé de trois minutes. Puis, ils répondront aux questions de nos journalistes, questions qui n'ont pas été préalablement soumises. Le candidat interrogé a deux minutes pour répondre. Sa réponse est ensuite commentée en une minute trente par chacun de ses adversaires. Le voyant lumineux que sur, vous voyez sur le bureau des chefs de parti s'allumera 30 secondes avant la fin d'une intervention. Le clignotement indiquera que le temps imparti est écoulé. Environ 80 minutes après le début de l'émission, M. Kawad sera invité à se joindre au débat. Charles. Well, now for the opening statements. And first, Mr. Trudeau. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Je suis très heureux d'être ici ce soir. Durant toute cette campagne électorale, throughout this election campaign, I have been saying that I believed in dialogue and debate. I do believe that the government of a democratic country must be essentially based on intelligence and reasoning. I believe that in an election campaign, we have been trying to exchange ideas with the people. We feel that a good government can exist only if it is supported by the people. Some say that and there might have been some risks for a Prime Minister to accept this type of debate. I rather think that the risk would exist if we didn't accept debate, because a democracy is essentially an exchange of ideas between those who govern and those who are governed, and a good government can only exist if there is this kind of exchange of ideas, this kind of confrontation between those who aspire to lead the people. I believe in this Canada, I believe in this very exciting and growing country of ours. I know there are problems. I know these problems affect especially the poor, those who don't have enough houses, the old people who can't make ends meet, those who don't find enough jobs. This is why we have governments and a democracy, in order that the people be able to express these problems, in order that those who govern them be able to discuss the solutions, and it's in this sense that we can have a good government if we share not only the problems but the hopes for the future. And this is what we want to do in this election and this is what we hope we will be doing in the future. Thank you. Mr. Stanfield, your opening statement, please. At the outset, I would like to, to mention briefly Senator Robert Kennedy, whom the world mourns. Il vit très bien les conflits qui affligent he knew the conflicts which afflicted American society, and he made an appeal to the conscience of his country and not its prejudices. He was a rich man, but a man who was really concerned with the poor and the oppressed. He always tried to bring out what was good in America, not what was less good. He was not satisfied with simple slogans. He searched solutions for the problems of his country. And 
in the spirit of this tragic loss, conscious of our own society here, we must recognize that our prime responsibility is to Canadian democracy that we owe it. I hope the parties and party leaders would, would work to bring the Canadian people together and not to push them apart. This has been my intention, as it is now, and will continue to be. But we are faced by serious problems in Canada, and it's my purpose tonight not to exchange platitudes, but to discuss the issues. We have a housing crisis in our country, and we have presented specific policies to meet this crisis, to help the ordinary Canadian acquire a home, to ease the load somewhat on the tenant caught by escalating rentals, and to create more jobs through more housing starts. And I'm prepared tonight to discuss these policies. We must do something also about the condition of the hundreds of thousands of Canadians who are poor and growing poorer. And uh, another generation of Canadians is being trapped in poverty, and we propose to reform our inefficient and wasteful uh, welfare system with a view to increasing initiative, improving skills, and uh, helping uh, those who are either caught by public welfare or personal, personal poverty to regain a sense of personal dignity and accomplishment. And we're prepared tonight, I'm prepared tonight to discuss these policies. The Prime Minister and his Minister of Finance say that our economy has never been stronger. But Canadian wage earners, Canadian pensioners, and Canadian uh, consumers can't agree with this because they know that we have a serious problem of unemployment as well as record inflation with record rates of interest. And while our government visits the financial capitals of the world to borrow money to meet their expenditures, one of the first duties of a new government must be to restore confidence inside and outside Canada, and I'm prepared to discuss these policies. And we have proposed specific policies relating to agriculture, and I'm prepared to discuss these and other policies tonight. Thank you, Mr. Stanfield. Now, Mr. Douglas, your opening statement, please. These are troubled times in which we live. The world around us is racked with dissension and violence. Here in Canada, so far, we have escaped these dangers. But all of us are concerned about our country and its future. We're disturbed because of the danger of disintegration from within and the threat of absorption from without. We're disturbed because Canadians in some regions have less social and economic opportunities than those in others. We're disturbed because our economy is not expanding fast enough to find jobs for all our people and because some half a million Canadians live below the poverty line. We're disturbed because rising living costs and inadequate housing is bringing frustration and resentment into our lives. We're disturbed because thousands of our farmers and fishermen are caught in an economic squeeze. But things don't have to be this way. The answer lies in a strong federal government capable of initiating programs to cope effectively with these problems. I believe that this can be done without violating the traditional linguistic and cultural rights of the French-speaking community. I believe that we can marshal the human, material, and financial resources of this country to eradicate poverty, inequality, and insecurity. But to do this, we must be prepared to revise our scale of values. Cooperation must take precedence over competition. People before profits. Planning before drifting. I believe in this country, its people, and its future. With our vast resources, with our technical know-how, we can make this a land where every child will have enough to eat, where every young person capable of absorbing an education will be able to get one, where every person who wants to work can find a job, and where every family that wants a home will be able to own one, a land where our old people can live out their days in dignity and security, 
and where our young people can live useful and meaningful lives. As Canadians, you and I can strive for nothing better, and surely we should settle for nothing less. Thank you, Mr. Douglas. But now, incidentally, these earpieces, which you'll be seeing through the debate, are for the translation. If, and if there are any brief pauses as we go along, it's because we're waiting for the finish of the translation. Well, now for the debate. And gentlemen, I hope you'll have at each other. The questions will be put by our panel of broadcast journalists. And they are Jean-Marc Poliquin of Radio-Canada, Tom Gould, CTV, and Ron Collister of the CBC. Ron? Mr. Trudeau, if this debate had been held last week, this question probably wouldn't have been asked. But this week, we've been made aware in the ugliest possible way that this is the violent society we live in. In view of the increasing violence in North America, are you prepared to require the fingerprinting and stringent licensing of all owners of all firearms? Of all owners of, of all firearms. I don't think that this would effectively prevent the illegal use of firearms. People who use firearms in an illegal way are very hard to control. We have introduced uh, amendments to the criminal code which we hope will permit to at least control those firearms which are the dangerous ones, those which can be concealed, handguns, sawed-off shotguns, and other dangerous forms of automatic weapons. We want to restrict the use, the the purchasing, the selling of these arms, uh, it will be a difficult enough job to ensure the registration of all such arms, to ensure their control. I think it wouldn't be practical to want to uh, demand legally the fingerprinting of all users of all arms, which would include hunting guns and many other types of, of uh, sporting weapons. Therefore, I think we mustn't try to go too far lest we have legislation which cannot be effective. We must try to have good effective legislation in that type of arm which can easily be concealed and which is generally the kind of arm that uh, illegal people want to use. Mr. Stanfield? Uh, I don't believe that we should resort to uh, fingerprinting necessarily because I don't think it's possible to prevent uh, all assassinations of this sort. For example, I was sitting behind the Prime Minister this afternoon in church and uh, could quite easily have done him in and nobody could possibly have stopped me <laughs> if I'd suddenly gone off my, uh, off my rocker. I'm interested in doing him in some other way, but not that, not that way. But it may be that we should consider uh, going further than, than we have uh, in connection with, with weapons not merely those that are possibly concealed, but uh, taking some measures to, to see that the uh, permits are not held by psychotics or by uh, people of this sort. I don't wish to interfere unduly with the freedom of, of our people, our hunters, and, and people who are members of gun clubs and this sort of thing who pursue legitimate activities. But uh, uh, I do believe that we should consider at least uh, ensuring, as far as we can, that dangerous people, people who are dangerous because of their mental condition, for example, uh, don't have permits to hold uh, guns. And I don't minimize the difficulties in, in supervising or enforcing such a provision. Mr. Douglas, please. It seems to me that the legislation which was before the House and which unfortunately was never proceeded with is a good first step. I think we ought to require the registration of all small arms. I think we should make it a criminal offense for any person to carry weapons unless he has a special dispensation from the police and is in some danger. And I think it's a, a great pity that Canada has been so slow in introducing such legislation, and it's even more regrettable that the House dissolved without dealing with that legislation and some of the other legislation which was on the order paper. But. The danger is not just in weapons. The danger is in the kind of people who can get hold of weapons. I think that governments in Canada have been singularly neglectful about the whole problem of mental illness. The, the case of Lee, Oswald Harvey, uh, Lee Harvey Oswald, who 
is alleged, uh, the, was allegedly the uh, person who assassinated President Kennedy. The, the story of his life is interesting, that when he was 14 years of age, uh, he was proven to be a psychotic who should have been brought to treatment. Nothing was done. And here in Canada, we have left mental illness out of our hospital insurance plan. We've left mental illness out of our Medicare plan. And unless we have some consistent program for locating people who are psychotics and treating them, we will have many other cases of violence. A question now for Mr. Stanfield from uh, Tom Gould. Mr. Stanfield, a number of opinion polls in recent months have indicated growing public concern over the tax burden imposed by all levels of government in Canada. Some economists say the tax load is reaching the outer limits of toleration. Will you now, and I address this question equally to Mr. Trudeau and Mr. Douglas, will you now give the Canadian taxpayers a commitment not to raise federal taxes above their present general level if you form a government after June 25th? I believe, I agree that I think that Canadian taxes have uh, reached their, their limit. And uh, I agree that the share of the gross national product uh, taken by taxes should not be allowed to increase. We are committed in my party to remove the 11 percent uh, sales tax on building materials, although we recognize that this may have to be placed, replaced in whole or in part from a tax of some other source. Uh, it's our belief that, uh, that uh, through cooperation with the provinces, uh, through working out priorities with the provinces to ensure that the limited resources that are available uh, go to the most important purposes. This is the most important step to be taken in connection with maintaining the tax, tax level as it is. I agree that, that uh, the present tax level is, is inflationary and that increases in taxes at this level are inflationary. So you have, you have the two reasons, at least, for ensuring that, uh, that uh, the tax level is not allowed to take a bigger slice of the gross national product. It's the effect on the individual Canadian taxpayer who's bearing such a load now and the inflationary pressures that increases in, tax, uh, in taxes produce uh, at this level. So I state firmly that... Uh, uh, as far as the federal government is concerned, I would not allow the, our share of the uh, gross national product, our share of taxation, take a bigger share of the gross national product, and we work closely with the provinces to uh, cooperation to see, as best I could, this was true of taxation over the whole country. Mr. Douglas. Well, even more important than deciding whether taxes should go up is whether or not the tax burden is equitably distributed. This is the problem that we should be facing up to. The Carter Report, which uh, came from a commission appointed by the Conservatives, and the report of uh, which commission was made to the present government, uh, has been ignored by both the parties. And I think we ought tonight to know where both the government and the official opposition stand with reference to this report. Here's a report which says, first, that the burden of taxation falls too heavily on the middle and lower income groups which says, secondly, that the freeloaders, the oil companies, the insurance companies, the mining companies, the stock speculators and land speculators are getting a free ride that some $5,000 million of income a year is virtually untaxed, and that if these people paid the same taxes as other businessmen and other personal income taxpayers, that we would increase government revenue by over $600 million, even on the basis of 1964 and that we could reduce the personal income tax for practically all Canadian citizens with incomes under $10,000. Seems to me before we talk about raising taxes or lowering taxes, the first thing to do is to have an equitable and fair and just tax system. And I say to Mr. Trudeau that you can't talk about a just society until he first of all is prepared to commit himself to establishing a just tax structure in this country. Mr. Trudeau. Well, I think it might be well to remind ourselves that the federal taxes between 1962 and 1968 did not go up.
go up, they went down. If you take the average person, if you take the income earner of about $5,000 with two dependents, his tax was in the area of 220. It was in the area of 280. It's now 220. The difference is, of course, that the total taxes, which include provincial and municipal tax, that did go up considerably. If you look once again over a period of 10 years, total federal taxes only went up by something like 56 percent, whereas total provincial and municipal taxes went up by something like 206 percent. Therefore, it's obvious in our country that the federal proportion of taxes is ri rising very slowly, not at all as fast as it is in the provinces, including your own province, Mr. Stanfield, where you come from. It's, uh, it's a question for the Canadian government to balance their expenditures with their revenues over the long haul. It's, uh, I wouldn't promise that taxes wouldn't go up. I would promise that we will limit our expenditures so that we don't have to raise our taxes any more than we have to. Question now for Mr. Douglas uh, from Jean-Marc Poliquin. Monsieur Douglas, étant donné les ravages caused by inflation, particularly in the case of pensioners and other persons who are on fixed income, what concrete steps do you commit yourself to taking in order to stop the ero erosion of the purchasing power of the ca Canadian dollar? Well, the kind of inflation we've had in this country has not been uh, an inflation due to a lack of consumer demand. What we've had in this country is what is commonly called a cost push inflation. It's an inflation which has largely come from excessive profiteering, as can be shown uh, by the figures uh, over the past 10 years. Just before he left office, the, Mr. Nicholson, the former Minister of Labor, conceded that from 1957 to 1964, the Cost, the labor cost per unit of production had gone up 3%, whereas profits in that period have gone up 18%. The fact is that we have had many instances of unnecessary increase of prices. We've had the Ford Motor Company who just raised the price of their cars some $90, despite the fact that their sales were up last year and that their profits have virtually doubled. The steel companies, the copper companies, Many of the companies who have raised their prices during the past few years have done so, not because of the increased costs, but because they've taken advantage of the situation. We say that there are a number of things we must do. One of the things we must do is to set up a prices review board. We think that any corporation increasing its prices must be prepared to justify that increase. Trade unions are required to go before conciliation boards and justify any request they make for an increase in wages. We see no reason why corporations ought not to be required to do the same. We think that the disclosure, the investigation into their books, the ability of the government to ascertain whether or not their prices are increased prices are unwarranted or whether they are due merely to unconscionable profiteering is something that should be made public and government action should be taken accordingly. Mr. Trudeau. Here again, we'll, we have to look at the facts. It is true that the consumer price index over the last five years of Liberal administration have increased by 14 percent or thereabouts, but during the same period, the uh, disposable revenue after taxes the take-home pay, if you like, has increased by 34 percent, which means that it is far ahead of the advance in prices. Of course, the fact is that we should limit any inflationary pressure. That is why, as a government, we have decided that we were going to balance our expense with our income and keep our budget in as close a state of balance as possible. That is why also we have created a price 
uh, 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 consumers re uh, price review board not to justify the companies bringing in about an increase in their prices. I oppose Mr. Douglas on that point because that is not a power we have under the Constitution. But we can have a board which will provide standards, which will inform the public, and which will make it possible for the public to judge whether prices are justified or not, but which will not give the government, and that is a constitutional issue, the power to prevent these increases. Mr. Stanfield, please. Well, certainly, we must give urgent attention to, uh, to inflation. Uh, between April of 1967 April 1960. Eight, the cost of living went up, I think, 4.6 percent in Canada. Uh, this is uh, bound to undermine confidence in our country and our future unless we can get this under, under control. Uh, it involves uh, restraint on behalf of government and uh, the effort of the government of Canada to provide leadership in uh, assisting all governments in Canada, total government expenditures in Canada, in being related to the needs of the economy. We must have an appropriate monetary policy. We must have an appropriate budgetary policy. This involves not merely the federal government, but an attempt to, to provide information and uh, exchange plans with the provinces and, and between the federal government and the provinces, with a view, as I say, to exercising restraint throughout the country. And uh, we must work on priorities uh, to ensure that uh, the money goes where it's most needed. It be our intention to call upon business and labor to cooperate with the government in maintaining restraint, with the government setting an example in this respect. And we would propose to, through, in cooperation with government and labor, with business and labor in the provinces, to establish uh, guidelines flexible in order to educate and use moral suasion to maintain restraint throughout the economy. A question now for Mr. Trudeau from uh, Jean-Marc Poliquet. Mr. Trudeau, Mr. Trudeau, the Americans control 46% of our manufacturing industry, 62% of our oil and gas industry, natural gas industry, 35% of our pulp and paper industry, and 91% of our rubber industry. You who have just uh, said, long live free Canada, I would ask a question. In order to shore up foreign domination of our resources, what measures would you take among those being recommended by the Watkins report. I can, I think, subscribe to all views in the Watkins report. There are some techniques recommended there, too, which uh, I think could meet the government's views, which have indeed been proceeded for, a reform in our Companies Act, for instance, which will make it mandatory for a foreign company to publish their figures. I might say, too, and I would repeat this, we also intend to set up the Canadian Development Corporation, which will make it possible for us to channel Canadian funds into the development of our own resources. But I will repeat at this point that what is important is not so much to complain about the past, in spite of the problems, but to look after the future. And all our policy is not directed to the repurchase or the recovery of those industries dominated by foreign interests, but towards the investment of Canadian savings in industries which will dominate the world of tomorrow. In other words, as Canadians, as a government, we must be able to channel our savings into those key industries industries of the world of tomorrow, the highly specialized technological industries, those industries which are based on our natural resources, those industries which are native to our soil, so to speak. That is why, why, as a government, we will apply a great many of the recommendations of the Watkins Report. We will also have our own policy, which will consist in promoting, in a most intensive way, research, so that we will not so much dominate the economy of tomorrow, but so as to correct the events of tomorrow. Mr. Stanfield. Well, I don't believe that we should... Uh, restrict outside investment, although it's clear from the Watkins report that American control of certain sectors of Canadian industry uh, uh, has increased at a rate to which we should give attention. I certainly believe that we're entitled to uh, make sure that control of certain basic 
economic institutions remains in our country uh, relating to communication, transportation. I would include the banks. But I would not wish to restrict outside investment uh, beyond this. Uh, I think, however, we should insist that uh, subsidiaries of foreign companies do comply with Canadian policy and Canadian laws, and uh, surely, we can, surely we can bring this about and see that this happens. But I think, above all, we should encourage our own people to invest. And in this connection, I noticed that the Minister of Finance, Mr. Benson, complained to the, uh, some of our investment people that uh, they were putting too much of their money or a bigger share of their money into American companies. Well, this must only be because they didn't have the same confidence in the growth of Canadian companies and the Canadian economy. And one of the most important things we can do, therefore, to, is to encourage Canadians to invest in Canada by developing a dynamic and growing and stable Canadian economy where companies can prosper and be really attractive to Canadian investors. Mr. Douglas. The New Democratic Party supports the recommendations of the Watkins report because we believe that unless we can regain the economic control of our own country, it's only a matter of time until we lose the political control. But I'm interested in the statement of Mr. Trudeau that uh, if elected, the Liberal Party will introduce legislation to set up the Canada Development Corporation. This was in the Liberal program in 1963. It was promised again in 1965. It was promised in the speech from the throne last year. Now, Mr. Trudeau is not the leader of the opposition trying to get into government. He's the, a member of a party that's been in office for five years and have had fam f plenty of opportunity to set up the Canada Development Corporation. And I think it's rather significant that in the uh, red book containing the 80 proposals of the Liberal Party that uh, the Canada Development Corporation has been significantly dropped. Now, if uh, Mr. Trudeau is now announcing uh, that there's some change of mind, uh, I think this will be interesting. But in view of the promises that have been made, about which nothing has happened, uh, one is reminded of the old uh, Chinese proverb that uh, there's a lot of noise on the stairs, but uh, nobody comes into the room. And nothing has been happening about this Canada Development Corporation except promises. And I think that the government... Uh, must demonstrate something more than uh, uh, a last deathbed repentance at this late hour. Question now for Mr. Stanfield. It'll be put by uh, Ron Collister. Ron? Mr. Stanfield, Mr. Douglas has already addressed himself to part of this question, but it's a comprehensive question, and I would like to hear the views of all three leaders on it. So the question is this. Election promises cost money. Will you raise it through a capital gains tax? And do you agree with the Carter Commission that Canadians are taxed unequally and that a dollar should be a dollar, however you earn it and however you make it? I certainly agree that uh, there's room for improvement in the instance, the, the equity of our tax system, and that uh, certainly it's the responsibility of government to uh, work in this direction as rapidly as possible. Mr. Collister, uh, I don't... Uh, I don't uh, favor a capital gains tax at this time. Uh, I think that there are arguments in favor of it as a social measure uh, on, the, on the argument that uh, those who pay, make an income are taxed, therefore those who, pay, uh, uh, those who make a capital gain should pay a tax on that. Uh, I recognize this. Also, I recognize that, uh, that uh, capital gains tax, however, uh, well, it's been applied in the United States, a moderate capital gains tax, and it hasn't, as uh, far as I can see, undermined the initiative of the American people in comparison with ourselves. But on the other hand, it's, it's pointed out to me that uh, Canada is a country that's short of capital. Canada is a country that uh, therefore needs to encourage the accumulation of capital and the investment of capital. And we've just been talking about the importance of, invest of Canadians investing in, uh, in Canadian industries. And uh, consequently, I think at this time, a, uh, a case is not a sufficient case has not been made for a capital gains tax, because of the detrimental it might effect it might ha might well have on the formation of capital in Canada to be investment, and the tendency and the readiness to invest it in Canada. Uh, furthermore, it is not a great producer of revenue, 
So, on balance, I'm not convinced that a capital gains tax is appropriate for Canada today. Mr. Douglas. Well, the leaders of both the other parties have now placed themselves on record as being opposed to a capital gains tax. This is difficult to understand when you realize that Canada is almost the only country left in the Western industrialized world that doesn't have a capital gains tax. What justification can there be for allowing a man who makes $50,000 on the stock market or in a big land speculative deal going scot-free when we tax people uh, down to $1,000 if they're single or down to $2,000 if they're married? When we ask a man to pay a tax on $5,000 who's get, trying to raise a, a family and allow someone else with a stock option to make thousands of dollars and go scot-free, it seems to me this is uh, fiscal injustice of the very worst kind. Uh, Mr. Trudeau earlier was talking about the, how much tax people pay. I think it's worth remembering that in this country, on the basis of uh, 1967, that any man with a wife and two children uh, earning $6,500 a year paid a tax of $633. But a man who made twice that, $13,000 with a wife and two children, if his income came from dividends paid by taxable Canadian corporations, he didn't pay a five-cent piece uh, of income tax. It seems to me that the Carter Report put its finger on this uh, and suggested that we Canadians ought to do something about it. Your reaction, Mr. Trudeau? Well, naturally, our whole tax structure has to be revised, and that's why the Carter Commission was set up to take a look at a tax structure which had grown up over the years, piecemeal, a little bit here and a little bit there. And the uh, Carter Report, in all its recommendations, has some very interesting uh, points of view, but it can improve, be improve, improved upon too, and that is what we are doing in the government. We have already sent it to a committee which began to study it, the Parliamentary Committee on Economic Affairs, uh, we are going to introduce, and we've announced this, a reform of the tax laws of Canada, which will be based in part on the Carter Report, which will be, if I can put it this way, an improved version of the Carter Report. Uh, the question of whether there will be uh, capital gains or not will be not be decided on a matter of, of principle. Uh, there's nothing moral or immoral about uh, the absence or the presence of a capital gains tax. It's a matter of knowing whether you will raise enough money to make it worthwhile killing the incentives which are created through uh, the absence of a capital gain, and this is the decision we will have to take. I do agree that the result will have to be a fair tax burden for all Canadians, and this is what our tax reform law will be. Question now for Mr. Douglas. It will be put by uh, Tom Gould. Mr. Douglas, we've heard over the past few weeks some widely conflicting claims on the present state of the Canadian economy. The Prime Minister and the Minister of Finance have said the economy is on the upswing. The Liberal Party, as you pointed out in your opening speech, says that Canadians have the strongest economy in their history. You and Mr. Stanfield say the economy is in a mess, and that we're in serious trouble, and you've inferred that the government is in some way hiding the facts. On what factual evidence do you base your accusations, sir? I base my accusation on the fact that the rate of economic growth last year was just half of what it was the year before. That the Economic Council of Canada has said that we must have a rate of economic growth of between 55 and 6 percent in order to provide enough jobs to maintain reasonably full employment. Our rate of growth last year was 2.8 percent. This is a long way from 55 to 6 percent. Our shortfall because of unemployment in Canada was uh, some $2 billion, $300 million of lost product, pr production in this country. Our unemployment already this year is running about 20 to 25 percent higher than last year. If it continues at its present figure, our unemployment this year could be over 5 percent. This is not a very good sign. Now, the, it's true the government have been doing some cooking on the figures. I asked, them to, I, I asked them to look at the four areas which promote economic growth, and they are investment, consumer demand, government spending, and exports. Those are the four things that depend, that, upon which growth depends. Let's look at them. In investment, 
The Department of Trade and Commerce has issued figures to show that it, the volume of uh, investment will only be up by 1%, and in the business sector, it will actually be down, not up. In consumer demand, with increased unemployment, consumer demand will be down, not up. Government spending, the government itself has admitted that it's curtailing its expenditures. And if we look at exports, with our exports of wheat only 40% of what they were last year, with our tourist trade down because we can't hope to match the uh, tourist trade we had during Expo, then all the economic indicators point to the fact that our economy is not growing that unemployment is increasing and that this economy of ours is not in a healthy state and the party in power must accept the major responsibility for that fact. Mr. Trudeau? Well, if Mr. Douglas is going to quote the report of the Economic Council, it might be worthwhile adding that they said that Canada is now going through the longest uninterrupted period of economic growth that it's had that exists in the history of the Canadian business cycle. It's true that last year the... Uh, growth slowed down a bit. But what is also true is that we've not only increased our gross national product, the total of goods and services produced by all Canadians, by 50 percent. We've increased our exports, and exports are going up. We've reached a record number of uh, beginnings in, in, uh, in housing in the past year. There has been, as I repeat, uh, as the Economic Council says, the longest period of economic growth, uninterrupted growth, in Canada's business cycle history. Now, in the past, when you had such a period of growth, it very often was, it always was followed by some kind of a slump. Difference is, this time there is no slump, there's a slight period of adjustment. It remains true that the unemployment figure of last year is lower than it has been, except for the two previous years. It's, years, it's lower than it had been in any year since 1956. It was slightly higher last year than the two previous years, but only slightly. Therefore, we don't believe that the future or the present is gloomy, as, you, as Mr. Douglas seems to believe. We believe that we've managed to, again, I quote the Economic Council, to be remarkably successful in preventing a recession. Mr. Stanfield. Well, I agree that there's, there are difficulties, serious difficulties in the uh, Canadian economy. Uh, Mr. Trudeau talks about the long period of growth. Uh, this, is, of course, is due mainly to the fact that uh, there's been a long period of growth uh, in our best customer, the United States, which has supported. We've had very favorable uh, ec economic conditions to support a long period of growth. In fact, our growth in Canada has slowed down for the last couple of years. Uh, to about half the rate that the Economic Council of Canada uh, says is necessary to provide the number of jobs that we need for young Canadians entering our workforce. And uh, there's the effect on employment. The slow growth is also the effect on tax revenues from the provinces, making it increasingly difficult for them to finance even existing programs with the existing level of taxes. Interest rates, as a result largely of the inflation that the government has encouraged and, committed and, and permitted, are at record levels. The NHA rates, for example, are two and eight points. Uh, nine one eight percent is against seven percent a year ago, an increase of thirty percent in one year. And the cash balances of the government are, are down very substantially, with people cashing in their Canada savings bonds heavily in order to take advantage of higher rates of interest. I think we have very real problems, all right. Question now for Mr. Trudeau from uh Tom Gould. Mr. Trudeau, are you prepared to make public, and I address this question equally to Mr. Stanfield and Mr. Douglas, are you prepared to make public the list of contributors to your election campaign funds with the amounts contributed before or soon after the vote on June 25th? And if not, why not? No, I'm not prepared to make that list public, nor is it something which is recommended by the Barbo Commission, which looked at election reforms. It is not the kind of uh, recommendation which has been accepted in any democratic country which I know. The important thing is not to force people to make these donations public. I think it might be encouraged by making these donations tax-free, uh, the important thing is that our laws and our election laws be reformed in order to make sure that 
All parties are as on an equal footing as possible by reducing election expenses, by making the government assume as large a part of the election expenses of all parties as is possible. This is uh, in line with the recommendations of the Barbo Commission. I have indicated that it would have top priority if our government would be returned to implement this type of, of election reform. Uh, I don't think that there is any basic need to force people to make public what they do with their money, if they want to give it to a party or if they want to give it to a trade union or if they want to give it to a church. It should be up to them to decide what they want to do with it. The danger is when parties depend too heavily on monies uh, of, of people who might, might attempt to control them, and that's why I think the problem should be attacked not by making the money public but by reducing the expenditures which are necessary in an election. And we, for our party, intend having a long-term financing plan which will render this reliance on election gifts uh, unnecessary in the future. Mr. Stanfield. It was a matter of regret to me that uh, the report of the Election Committee, Committee on Election Practices, uh, was not put before the House. Uh, despite the fact it's been around for some time, and I would certainly, as Prime Minister, uh, bring the report uh, before the House. Uh, I would not, however, approve of, of contributions being made uh, public, uh, because I think this might uh, lead to pressure and, indeed, uh, discourage contributions. I think, in fact, the uh, legitimate expenditures relating to elections are increasing because of the development of our urban communities and the increasing size of our constituencies. And I would favor, under statutory uh, conditions and within uh, prescribed limits, having uh, such contributions uh, deductible for income tax purposes. And of course, such contributions would have to be reported for that purpose. But uh, uh, I want to encourage more public participation in the support of political parties. and. Uh, publishing returns, publishing contributions would not do this, but permitting uh, deductions to be made for income tax purposes would be helpful in this regard. Mr. Douglas. We would certainly be in favor of uh, producing all the list of contributors. As a matter of fact, we turned over our books containing the list of contributors to the Commission on Election Expenses. I, I can't agree with Mr. Trudeau that uh, the Bible Commission did not uh, advocate this. They called for full disclosure, and there ought to be full disclosure. There's a great deal of difference between people making contributions to a church or to a trade union and contributing to a political party, because people who contribute to a political party could be seeking to buy favors, could be seeking to secure contracts or appointments or patronage at some later date, and the public has a right to know what contributions are made to political parties. And they will then be in a position to look at that list and see if that particular corporation is favored by the government that uh, secured their uh, contribution. The uh, Election Expenses Committee showed, that, of course, that the contributions to the two parties in this country ran into millions of dollars, and that in the case of the Liberal Party, the contributors were between three and four hundred with contributions averaging up to $75,000. This is a very small group of contributors. And I think that they have no right to be anonymous. I think the Canadian people have a right to know where political parties get their money, and they have a right to know whether or not those persons who make those contributions uh, uh, expect to get some political favours as a result. Question now for Mr. Stanfield from uh, Monsieur Poliquin. Monsieur Stanfield. Recognize that each province has, in some way, a special status for geographical reasons, linguistic reasons, or economic reasons. Beyond these spheres, should Quebec have a particular status or special political powers for sociological reasons? I am not in favor of, of uh, one province being granted powers that are not offered to all the provinces. On the other hand, I, I, I recognize that uh, Quebec, the province of Quebec, for example, 
has its uh, special interests and special aspirations by virtue of being uh, something over 80 percent uh, French speaking. Uh, I recognize this. I recognize that other provinces might have particular interests. Uh, in any constitutional discussion regarding distribution of powers, I would insist upon the maintenance of the essential powers of the federal government, which are many, but which include the authority to uh, necessary authority to develop our country and to uh, ensure the participation of all parts of our country uh, in that development. But if, for example, the continuing committee of the Prime Minister and the Premiers established for, co for constitutional purposes, purpose of constitutional revision, should consider that requests from a province could be met without infringing upon the essential powers of the federal government, I would want this power offered to all the provinces, although it might not be of equal interest to all of them. And I think the country could stand uh, within limits a certain amount of this, and I presume that the the continuing committee, the Prime Minister and the Premiers would bear this in mind when considering uh, what allocation, reallocation of powers might take place. But definitely, any powers offered must be offered to all the provinces, although they might not be equally interested in, in exercising. Mr. Douglas, please. Well, I believe that we must have a strong central government if we're going to be able to cope with new problems that couldn't possibly have been envisaged by the Fathers of Confederation. Unemployment, automation, manpower training, housing, pollution, marketing of farm products. This will mean undoubtedly giving to the federal government by delegation certain powers. I believe that most of the provinces would be prepared to agree to some such delegation. It may be that there are certain things, particularly higher aid to education, which I think the federal government must eventually handle, that Quebec would balk at because it felt that this was a, an infringement upon the traditional rights which have been guaranteed to it through the years. And I would say that in an instance like that, the government of Canada and the parliament of Canada would be wise to do what we did in the Canada pension plan where nine provinces agreed to allow Ottawa to handle a Canada pension plan, and the government of Canada agreed to let Quebec handle its own pension plan, providing that they were uniform and that they uh, were portable. This has worked out quite well. The choice was either to have two Canada pension plans, in name at least, or none at all. And I think that under those circumstances, a particular status uh, is advisable if we are going to keep faith with the commitments which have been made to the French-speaking community down through the years. Mr. Trudeau. Now, the difficulty with providing a particular status, a special status to any province is this. If that province has many more powers than the other provinces, according to Mr. Stanfield's formula or Mr. Faribault's formula, or according to Mr. Klisch or Mr. Douglas's formulae, these are all different, of course. But if a province then has far more powers than an other province, it is impossible to think that this province will be able to send here to Ottawa politicians with as much power as those coming from the other provinces. In other words, it is impossible for Quebec, for instance, to have very special powers in the area of broadcasting, in the area of external affairs, for example, or in the taxation field, and then to expect that that province sends here in Ottawa Quebecers which will be able to say to the other provinces how to arrange their own affairs in those areas. That is why we have to choose. We have to see that all provinces be approximately equal, so that those people they send here to the federal scene will be just about equal too, or else we give a great, a great many powers to that province, a great many more powers, and that province renounces uh, the possibility of being equal to the others in the federal field. The Liberal Party has chosen we want to be equal throughout the country. That is why we are ready to be equal provincially. We do not want any special status. Question now for Mr. Douglas, and it comes from Ron Collister. 
Mr. Douglas, Mr. Trudeau has said that the Confederation will be destroyed if Quebec, without federal clearance, is allowed to participate at international conferences on education. And there's already a confrontation between Ottawa and Quebec over attendance at conferences in Paris and Gabon. If you are Prime Minister, will Quebec be free to take part in international conferences on education and other matters of provincial jurisdiction without the prior approval of Ottawa? Well, the position which our party has taken is that the federal government and the federal government alone can speak for Canada and international affairs, that only the government of Canada can make treaties and agreements with foreign powers. It seems to me there can be no argument about that. The Scott case of 1956, in my opinion, settled this once and for all. However, we must remember, on the other hand, that when the federal government does enter into a treaty, if the subject matter of that treaty has to do with pro things coming into, under provincial jurisdiction, if it has to do with health, with labor, uh, with education, that treaty is valueless unless it is ratified by the provinces. This is why most of the, uh, the orders under the International Labor Office have never been implemented in Canada. This is why uh, some of the uh, Charter of Human Rights of the United Nations has not been implemented in Canada. The government of Canada agreed, but until the provinces uh, are involved, then, of course, the agreement is merely a piece of paper. Consequently, I think that a government in Ottawa must involve the provinces. It must encourage them to participate in these negotiations. And I think the government at Ottawa is to be criticized that we haven't taken the initiative in inviting the provinces to take part in international conferences on education. I think the government at Ottawa should have invited the French-speaking nations to hold uh, an educational conference here in Canada. But I certainly do not think that any province, Quebec or any other province, ought to do this except through the machinery of the government of Canada. Mr. Trudeau, please. Well, on the principles, I'm completely in agreement with Mr. Gl Douglas, or rather he's in agreement with the white paper that we published on this matter not so long ago, and I'm sure Mr. Stanfield will be in agreement with it too. On the fact, Mr. Mr. Douglas is misinformed, because on the fact, the federal government, when it did form delegations to go to International Conference on Education, did invite provincial participation, and the provinces accepted. It happened in the Commonwealth Conferences on Education, uh, Mr. Pearson wrote to Mr. Johnson to suggest the same be done uh, on the French-speaking conferences. However, uh, therefore, I agree with these two gentlemen. The trouble is I don't agree, nor do they agree, with their spokesmen in Quebec, because mo both Mr. Clich, who speaks for the NDP in Quebec, and Mr. Faribault, who speaks for the Conservatives in Quebec, apparently, uh, say that they think the province of Quebec should be able to enter international agreements or have international jurisdiction in all areas which were, are within provincial jurisdiction. And Mr. Clich goes around saying that he's never been disavowed, so that must be the position of his party. Mr. Stanfield? Uh, my own view is that there's only, there can only be one sovereignty in Canada, that foreign policy must, of course, be one and indivisible and controlled by the government of Canada. On the other hand, provinces have had dealings abroad over a long period of time in a number of provinces. Uh, Ontario has had these, and uh, Quebec signed an agreement on agreements with the province with the government of France uh, under the Lesage government. Uh, this is not something under our Constitution that the, that the government of Canada can settle unilaterally. Uh, I favor very much this matter being referred to the continuing committee established at the last federal provincial conference to deal with constitutional matters, have them define precisely when it's appropriate for a province to have any dealings of any sort abroad, and uh, uh, then uh, uh, we, can, we can avoid this kind of confrontation that's going on today. Mr. Farabo uh, agrees with the guidelines that I've stated, that is, that, a pro that we must maintain the sovereignty of Canada, the supremacy of Canadian foreign policy, 
but a province can have dealings abroad on informal transactions in matters within its own jurisdiction, and we ought to have, this has been going on, we ought to have this settled definitely by the continuing committee. Question now for you, Mr. Trudeau, from uh, Ron Collister. Mr. Trudeau, do you regard this general election as a referendum on the future of Quebec in Confederation? And if you win, will you see the result as a mandate to deal firmly with Quebec? No, I don't regard it as a referendum on the future of Quebec in Confederation. We're asking for a mandate to apply a certain number of ideas in the area of the Constitution, in the area of economic policy, social policy, legal reform, international relations. We're asking for a mandate to carry out many aspects of this just and prosperous society. But uh, it is not a referendum on Quebec. Uh, I have indicated what our position was on the Constitution. Seven days or eight days after I became Prime Minister, I wrote to all the Premiers asking them to, send, to name their officials so that we could set up this continuing committee of officials to which Mr. Stanfield refers. They've already met uh, some ten days ago. They met with great success. They adopted positions which will be, they've uh, adjourned till somewhere in July. They will be continuing this discussion of all aspects of the Constitution. Uh, I think that our program on this matter is a clear one. I think that people have a right to know what they are voting for in terms of the Constitution. I think that they have a right to be told clearly by the party leaders what the, their party position is on all aspects of the Constitution. It is not by way of setting a referendum on this or, or on any other matter. It is by way of telling the people what kind of policy they will expect if this particular party gets elected into government. In our case, they do know. We're telling the people what our ideas are, and uh, we hope they will have confidence in them. Mr. Stanfield, your response? I think that the election does involve uh, confrontation uh, with, the, with the government of Quebec, particularly on the question of dealings abroad, and I don't think it can be settled. Uh, I don't think this issue can be settled in an election. I think the proper place to settle this and other constitutional questions is before, is before the continuing committee that was established by the Federal Provincial Conference in February. That's the place to settle it, and a confrontation in an election would only deepen the gulf because the the province of Quebec, the government of Quebec could presumably, get a, could presumably sweep the province on the same issue because other provincial parties, including the Liberal Party in Quebec, uh, take a, even a stronger stand on this presence of broad business than the present government of Canada. Now, as far as I agree that the political parties should put their position before the public, this is what we've been doing. But the position of the Conservative Party has been misrepresented by Mr. Trudeau and his candidates. Uh, who have tried to persuade English-speaking Canadians that we want to weaken the federal government, whereas his lieutenant, Mr. Marchand, in Quebec, uh, as reported by the press on May the 23rd, is trying to persuade the people of Quebec that we stand for too much centralization because we're controlled by Western elements in the country. I don't know what we can think of this. Mr. Douglas, your response, please. Well, I'm glad to hear Mr. Trudeau say that this election is not a referendum on Quebec, because I think this would be the best way to divide this country and to do irreparable harm to national unity. Of course, all of us and all the political parties want to see a strong United Canada. The question is how we do it. There's no disagreement now, I take it, between different political parties on the report of the B&B &B Commission recommending linguistic equality for... English-speaking and French-speaking Canadians in any part of this country. I think most of the premiers have now accepted it. Certainly the public has accepted it. But we still have two other problems that have to be dealt with if we're going to make Canada a united nation. And one is the inequality of income and opportunities in some parts of Canada compared to others. Right now, the unemployment in the Atlantic provinces is almost three times as high as in Ontario. In Quebec, it's more than twice as high as in Ontario, the per capita income is low. The other thing which we must do is that we must make the federal government effective, as I said before, to deal with problems like unemployment, manpower training, higher education, pollution, and housing. And we haven't done it. 
And we must work out the techniques by, by which we do this. It's not enough to say, just let's leave the Constitution the way it is. The Constitution we have today was built for the horse and buggy age. It's completely incapable of meeting the problems of the jet age. Question now, please, for Mr. Stanfield from Tom Gould. Mr. Stanfield, the amount of wheat now in storage on the prairies is at its highest level in 10 years. Wheat and flour exports for the current crop year are running about 50% behind those of the last crop year. Since governments consistently take credit for wheat sales, and since you and the other gentlemen here seek to form a government, how specifically do you propose to get rid of the 900 million bushels of wheat now in storage, and at what price? Well, the, the greatest uh, the fact, the thing that's most responsible for the present accumulation, the present record accumulation of Western wheat in Canada, is the failure of the Liberal government to maintain the price stabilization arrangement that the previous government worked out with Washington. And as a result of this, the, uh, the proportion of Canadian sales on the International Wheat Agreement have fallen, I think it's from 41% to 27% since 1963, while the, while the percentage of sales under the International Wheat Agreement by the United States has risen, I think, from 23% to 49% because of undercutting and more aggressive practices. So that one important measure to take to uh, get rid of this wheat, to sell this wheat, is to uh, rearrange the stabilization arrangements, the non-competition arrangements, the, to prevent undercutting in price with the United States. Uh, we would, however, pursue very aggressive uh, sales practices. We, uh, Mr. Alvin Hamilton, for example, had great success with sales of wheat when, when he was responsible, and uh, we, would, uh, we would press for wheat under the price of the international wheat agreement. But the most important factor to bear in mind is the maintenance of Canada's proper share of the wheat, its traditional share of the sale of wheat under the international wheat agreement, to sell aggressively and to prevent undercutting by the United States through the establishment of the kind of agreement that we had before that permitted Canada to sell 41 percent of the wheat sold under the international wheat agreement rather than 27 percent is now possible or has been possible under the present government. Mr. Douglas, your response, please. Well, there's no doubt that the wheat surplus of over 900 million bushels constitutes a real problem. I think the first concern must be, of course, for the producers of that wheat. I think that uh, any government in Canada has to give them a guaranteed price. This might be a good time for the Liberal Party to resurrect Mr. Pearson's promise of 1963 when he guaranteed them uh, a minimum of $2 a bushel plus a uh, two-price system per wheat, which would give them an additional 12 cents. I think we have to have, first of all, a guaranteed price. I think, secondly, we must promote sales. This means not only an aggressive sales policy, it may mean extending our credit facilities to enable uh, countries who want to buy wheat but haven't, aren't able to raise Canadian dollars at the moment or, or American dollars or gold uh, to purchase our wheat on long-term credits. And I think most important of all, we've got to begin to develop genuine two-way trade with some of these potential wheat customers. It's true we've sold very large quantities of wheat to the Soviet Union and to mainland China, but our purchases of goods from them represented about 2% of their purchases from us. Now, until we're prepared to work out some two-way trade with them so that they can earn more Canadian dollars, they're not going to be able to buy Canadian wheat except in a time of, of drought and famine. Mr. Trudeau. Well, there is a problem of the present storage of wheat, of course, but it's well to put the reality in perspective here, too. If you compare the last five years of Liberal administration with the previous years of the Conservative administration, revenues are up, productivity are up, and sales are up. Sales are at an average now of some 540 billion bushels, million bushels, and they were as compared to 340. Uh, what we have indicated we will do is to set a name of selling this wheat 
we want to get roughly one quarter of the of the uh, market world market for wheat but the important thing is that we have negotiated through the Kennedy round in Geneva we've negotiated with the United States and other wheat producers we've negotiated the international grains agreement the price there was set at a dollar ninety six and a half we have sustained we've supported this price we believe the United States will stand by its agreement and they will they will uh, ratify this international grains agreement and therefore we believe that in the future this grain will be sold we have indicated that cash advances would permit the farmer to go over the hump of any hardship we will increase cash advances from three thousand to six thousand dollars a year and we hope this will solve the present problem but uh, once again the situation now is better than it ever was in Canada the past five years is way above the previous five years after this question Mr. Cowett will join the debate but uh, there's a question first to Mr. Douglas and uh, of course with response from the others from uh, Jean-Marc Poliquin the interest rate on home mortgages is over 9% now and prevents thousands of Canadians from purchasing their own home. What would you do, Mr. Douglas, to lower this interest rate on home mortgages? Well, there are several things that would have to be done. One of the reasons for our high interest rates, of course, is that we have been consistently, as a matter of government policy, keeping our interest rates above the United States, our bank rate at 7 and a half percent compared to the American bank rate of five and a half. Uh, this is due to the fact that we've got a fixed exchange rate. We believe that a floating exchange rate would make us less vulnerable to interest rate changes in the United States. Secondly, we would set up a, a national capital investment board for the purpose of directing capital on the basis of social priorities. We think there are some things for which money is being borrowed on the open market, uh, which are postponable, that we can do for a while without uh, high-rise apartments or luxury hotels or more supermarkets or more uh, filling stations on every street corner, that we ought to have top priority for the capital which is available in Canada and that the top priority ought to go to housing and to community services. We have in Canada, as you know, uh, very large amounts of savings. We are the most saving people in the world. Uh, we are a net exporter of capital and have been over the past 10 years. A lot of our capital is going out of the country. What we ought to be doing now is directing the savings of the Canadian people, the money which is in insurance companies and pension plans and trust funds, into the avenues that will uh, not only provide housing, but would also stimulate the economy by a massive housing program because housing has a multiplier effect upon the economy. And every dollar we invest on uh, house construction uh, liberates two dollars uh, in the economy and in the form of economic activity. And for this reason, we believe that this is a number one priority. Mr. Trudeau, please. The country is, is a double reason. There is an external reason and a, an internal reason. The outer external reason is this. Canada has a free capital market to begin with, and its money goes where it brings in most revenue. And I can't understand Mr. Douglas what he says on the one hand that we should have here a interest rate equal to that of the United States, and who then adds in the same breath that we don't send money over to the United States. If our interest rate were not higher than the United States, Mr. Douglas, money would be invested more in the United States. If it comes to Canada or if it stays in Canada, it is because our interest rate is slightly higher. For these international reasons, then, we can't, we can't do much about that. It is because we have access to the international money markets that our interest rate follows the rates which is generally uh, applied in industrial countries. As far as the outside reasons are concerned, well, we have said, inside reasons are concerned, I'm sorry, we have already said that we're going to try to balance the budget, balance our national accounts. In other words, our action on the economy will be neutral. We will be adding no inflationary pressure 
Therefore, the interest rates in this country will have a tendency to go down. Now, as far as low-cost housing is concerned, as far as investments in uh, student residences is concerned, we have put in twice as much money this year uh, in comparison to other years, that is, to the year before. That is, the government is going in the right direction. Mr. Stanfield, you have the last word on this question. Well, unquestionably, interest rates have gone up phenomenally. In the past year, NHA rates have gone up 30 percent in one year. And this is due uh, to a number of factors. It's due to the continued uh, galloping inflation we've had in the country for about three years. Uh, it's due to the size, the mammoth size of the government's deficits for the past year, and particularly the past fiscal year, which has meant that the Canadian government has had to overwhelm the capital markets. As a result of, of uh, overwhelming the capital markets because of these deficits and the uh, prolonged inflation, there's been some uh, question about the determination of the government of Canada to maintain the, posi the competitive position of this country. And in the crisis, the international situation that developed through the winter, the government of Canada had to put up the bank, its bank rate to 7 percent, uh, uh, disproportionately as compared with the American bank rate. Now, to get it down, we've got to establish confidence. We've got to establish the conviction that the, the, the country will deal with inflation. We've got to establish restraint, uh, not only at the federal level, but by encouraging it throughout the country. And uh, establishing this confidence will enable the Canadian Bank of Canada to put down its bank rate, and uh, control of inflation will result in, in a substantial subsidence of interest rates. And uh, this is very important. Tel que convenu, nous invitons maintenant M. Kawet à participer to take part in the debate. Mr. Kawet, you might now, I think, give your opening statement. You have three minutes. First of all, I have the pleasure of saying hello to my friends in Temiskaming County, writing, and secondly, drawing the attention of all the people to the fact that for the past one hour and 20 or one hour and 30 minutes, you have been hearing statements from the three political parties, Liberal, Conservative, and NDP, with regard to what is happening and going on in Canada. Not, not one of them, neither the Prime Minister, nor the leader of the official opposition, nor the leader of the NDP, has spoken to you, however, of adapting the financial system to the needs of Canadians and to the C Canadian possibilities according to the possibilities we have of developing our country and making everything financially possible. You have heard speak of taxes, tax increases, or the possibility of not increasing taxes. But I sincerely believe that there is only one way to relaunch the Canadian e economy. First of all, put an end to credit restrictions. It's not when we have three or four hundred thousand unemployed that it is time to impose restrictions. I think that it is just as apropos for a na responsible national government to elaborate a plan or a system whereby we could give interest-free loans to the provinces who are in a morass, to the municipalities, to school boards. I repeat, interest-free loans, the same type of credit which we give to foreign countries. No, not the, any other type, the same type. These are margins of credit, lines of credit that we give to Africa, South America, everywhere throughout the world. Let's give these credit margins to people here in our country, the municipalities, the school boards, which at the present time cannot even pay their own teachers and employees. Another thing, a tax decrease. And to effectively combat unemployment, it is not th with a plan of taxing uh, the high income earner to give a little bit more to the less income. This will just increase the number of poor in Canada. For instance, they didn't speak of the Lausanne shipyards where hundreds and thousands of people are being laid off at the present time, whereas there is only one solution, and that is the establishment of a merchant marine. There is no time to speak of this. I understand we only have two hours. But throughout a whole election campaign, it seems to me that we could come in with concrete facts, concrete proposals, and sensible proposals to, to take the Canadian people 
for, instead of taking them for people who will rely on anybody during an election time. La première question, si vous le voulez, elle vous est adressée par Ron Collister. Mr. Cowett, the past five elections have produced four minority governments. Mr. Douglas says he doesn't expect to win, and you cannot win because you're not fielding enough candidates. In view of the record of political instability that seems to accompany minority government, are minor parties not a liability in our parliamentary system? I don't particularly share the opinion that you are expressing to the, ex to the, uh, to the, in the respect that a minority government is necessarily irresponsible. If it were to present legislation to the advantage of every Canadian, the Prime Minister knows very well that we would endorse it and that we would accept legislation which would be of benefit to all Canadians. But when a minority government comes in or introduces legislation like uh, the late Bill C-193, which was going to Im increase taxes by 5%, then we object. And then, if the government had been a majority government at that time, the Prime Minister, I'm sure, will be the first to admit that taxes would have been increased by 5%. But we were as... We were somewhat of a shock absorber in or, order to prevent ca the Canadian people from paying this 5% uh, tax. I think that a minority government, a responsible one, can certainly receive the support in the House of members who are there, not for the pleasure of playing politics, but for the general good of the population. I think this is what we have done. We shall continue to act in this way because, whether we like it or not, I still believe that after June 25, we will still have a minority government in Canada. And at that time, we will still continue playing a game, uh, not a game, as I have said, of pure politics, but a game of advantage to all Canadian citizens. We have had evidence, proof of this, when the government introduced another bill to introduce taxes by 3%. It had a majority. We were there. As a group, we voted against a tax increase because we are convinced that it is not time to increase taxes in Canada when everything has to be built up. There are no roads, no hospitals, no schools. All this is lacking. Consequently, it's not time to increase taxes, but it is time to think of using the Bank of Canada in order to use the monetary possibilities we have here with our people and with the means we have at our disposal. Monsieur Trudeau, votre réplique. I don't think that uh, it's up to me to say whether minority parties are a liability or an asset to Parliament. It's up to the Canadian people to decide who they will elect, and uh, I will stand by and abide by the results. However, I do think that uh, those minority parties which complain about some of the legislation which was not brought before the House, Mr. Douglas's party often complains that we didn't bring in the drug bills, that we, we didn't bring in the Can Canada Development Corporation, which was in our speech from the throne, I think, in fairness, we have to realize that the kind of parliaments we've had in the past have prevented the government from making as much progress as it would have liked to on many of these bills. Uh, all I can say is that we will, if elected as the government party, we will govern as best we can. We're asking for a mandate, a strong mandate. Our ideas are there. The people will vote for them or not. But uh, whether the result will be a liability or an asset is really, I think, a, an irrelevant question as far as I'm concerned. Mr. Stanfield. I uh, believe that the presence of several parties in the House makes the, the maintenance of a, of a debate more difficult and uh, certainly uh, is somewhat more time-consuming. I think that our parliamentary system probably works best under the two-party system or something approaching this, but certainly I respect fully the, the, that this is a choice for the Canadian people to make and uh, they, they vote for the man or the woman of their choice, and that's up to them. I was very interested, however, in Mr. Trudeau uh, uh, explaining the difficulty in carrying out reforms, the drug bill, the uh, agreements, uh, the report of the Parliamentary Rules Committee, uh, these and a great many other things went down the drain when the, the, the House was dissolved. And I have to say to Mr. Trudeau uh, that there's a if he's thinking himself in terms of being a reformer, he clearly chose, chose to sacrifice reform in this extent uh, in favor of a, of a, of a bid uh, for election.
Mr. Douglas? Well, the decision as to whether or not to be minority parties or not lies entirely with the electorate. Uh, had the people been satisfied that the two older parties were meeting their needs, new parties couldn't have arisen. It was because the public became convinced that the two older parties had become so much alike that there was little or no choice between them that other parties uh, sprang up. And I think that in time, we will get back to a two-party system, but it'll be a two-party system which will have a party right of centre and one left of centre. Uh, but this will take a, a process of adjustment. Now, I don't think that minority governments are necessarily a, a bad thing. If the government brings down good legislation, we will support it. If we don't, the electorate will get rid of us. As far as progress in the House is concerned, I want to point out to Mr. Trudeau that the, the, the legislation uh, which wasn't passed is legislation which they could have presented at any time. The opposition can hold up legislation, but only the government can decide what legislation will be introduced. And I pleaded with the Minister of Finance almost weekly to bring down the Canada Pension Plan. And before the Easter recess, we held the government up for a week trying to get them to bring down the drug bill. And we only gave up the filibuster when Mr. Pearson promised faithfully that the drug bill would be the first item discussed when we reassembled on the 23rd day of April. La prochaine question posée à M. Trudeau The next question put to Tom Mr. Trudeau will be put by Tom Gould. Communist China and Nationalist China have publicly and repeatedly taken the stand that recognition of one means breaking off relations with the other. Are you then prepared to extend diplomatic recognition to Peking and to tell the Canadian people tonight that you will go ahead with that recognition no matter what the consequences? No, I wouldn't say no matter what the consequences. Naturally, when uh, one exchanges the, uh, ambassadors with a country, it has to be in a way which is satisfactory to both parties. And uh, I think one country would be uh, a little bit weak to say that I will, I need to exchange ambassadors or diplomatic representations with you so badly that I will do it no matter what the consequences. I've, as I've said, and I repeat, that the recognition of the Peking government of the People's Republic of China is a necessity. I am prepared to ask Peking whether they are prepared to exchange ambassadors with us. I am not prejudging of what their answer will be. I will leave myself free if we are the government to decide how will we react to whatever conditions they might pose. We will have conditions of our own. But when you uh, decide to open diplomatic relations with a country, you must leave yourself free to do it in a way which is most advantageous to you. And if at the outset you say that you are prepared to renounce a certain number of conditions which are, not adv which are advantageous to you, then you are weakening your position. All I'm saying is that we are interested as a government in establishing diplomatic relations with Peking. We will make that step. We will see what their response is, and then we will judge how we have to proceed from there. But I'm not going to weaken my hand in advance. Mr. Stanfield. I felt for a long time that the only realistic policy is to recognize what is in fact the government of six or seven hundred million people in China. Uh, this isn't a question of whether we approve of the sort of government there. Actually, Canada does diplomatic business with quite a number of governments in the world, which we regard as oppressive and whose purposes we don't approve. It's simply, I think, that for purposes of, of international uh, dealings and uh, in the best interest of all concerned, it's realistic to recognize what is in fact a government. Now, I understand that Taiwan has taken the position in the past that it will, it will break diplomatic relations with any country that recognizes Red China. Uh, I would hope this would be changed because I don't think this is a realistic position for Taiwan to take. On the other hand, I certainly wouldn't want to see us in Canada sacrifice Taiwan uh, which actually has developed one of the most stable and one of the most rapidly advancing economies in the Far East. Uh, I would, uh, as I say, want to recognize a red China and uh, continue to maintain business with Taiwan. I recognize the difficulties that are involved. Mr. Douglas. 
For 10 years, the successive governments in Canada have talked about recognizing mainland China, and it's long overdue. Certainly, we ought to recognize mainland China. We ought to vote for her admission to the United Nations and for occupying the seat on the Security Council, which belongs to China. It's a sheer farce to suggest that Taiwan represents China in, on the Security Council. Now, with respect to any conditions applied, if Taiwan feels that our recognition of mainland China makes it impossible for her to continue to have diplomatic relations with us, then that is a decision which she must make. On the other hand, I do not think that Peking has any right to lay down terms. We're prepared to recognize her as the legitimate government of China. As far as uh, who is the government of uh, Formosa or of Taiwan, uh, this is a matter which I think ultimately must be settled by the United Nations. Having a referendum in Formosa, maybe the people of Formosa don't necessarily want the government that took over Formosa. Maybe they themselves would like to, to have uh, their own independence and set up their own government. And this is a matter which I think eventually has to be decided in the United Nations. Monsieur Cahouette. Euh, voici. Il n'est pas, je crois, dans les intérêts... I don't believe that it would be in the interests of Canada to interfere with the internal administration of any country whatsoever in the world. Here we are facing not only the administration of a country, but we're faced with an ideology which wants to spread throughout the world, that is, the communist ideology. At the present time, Free China, or Formosa, has been accepted in the United Nations. Communist China was has not yet been accepted there. And I think that, due to the difference which exists between the free countries, from a philosophical point of view, from a, the point of view of a convictions, that before calling or admitting or recommending Communist China to the United Nations, we must think about it very seriously and twice over. We must be on our guard. We must not take any chances because certain other countries in the world have transacted business with the communists and these countries regretted it subsequently. I think that Canada has not yet reached a position to recommend admit the admittance of communist China in the United Nations. Une question de Tom Gould pour Mr. Stanfield. One question by Mr. Tom Gould for Mr. Stanfield. Mr. Stanfield, a number of prominent Canadian politicians have called for a reassessment or a study or a review of Canada's military role in NATO. One of the most prominent is the president of your party, sir, Mr. Dalton Kemp. To clarify this issue, will you tell us specifically, is it your policy to lead Canada out of a military role in NATO? No. Oh. The policy of my party is to request a reassessment of the purposes, first of all, of the Atlantic Alliance, which was established uh, 20 years ago in response to the Cold War. Uh, we think that uh, under the changed conditions, it might be that the Atlantic Alliance could be broadened somewhat, the purposes broadened, so that it could play a, an even more constructive role towards preventing uh, proliferation of nuclear weapons and leading towards a detente. We would ask, therefore, for that kind of review. Secondly, we would ask for a review of Canada's role in the, in the Atlantic Alliance. Again, this was determined some nearly 20 years ago. Many things have changed since then, uh, including technological developments, a good deal of de-escalation de in, the, in the confrontation between the, the United States and, and Russia. And uh, I and my party would like to see our role reviewed in consultation with our allies to, to see if we're making the most appropriate uh, arrangements uh, with regard to the contribution that we're making. Perhaps we're not under present conditions. Certainly a review of our role, but not a unilateral uh, decision to withdraw, a position which I understood Mr. Trudeau to take shortly after he was elected leader of the party, although I noticed that the Liberal Party in its platform uh, takes a position asking for a reassessment or a review of something of this sort, whereas I had understood Mr. Trudeau to initially take the position that uh, Canada should uh, 
uh, withdraw its troops from, from this arrangement. Possibly I understood him, but that was misunderstood him. That was the impression I had. But I've stated the policy of my party. Votre réplique, Monsieur Douglas. Our party has taken the position consistently over the years that we should uh, withdraw from the military role uh, in NATO. We say that whereas 20 years ago there was a very genuine danger of the Soviet uh, juggernaut rolling across the Atlantic, uh, across the uh, Europe to the uh, Atlantic, that the likelihood of that happening now is extremely remote that the Soviet Union has difficulties with its own satellites, that there's a schism between the Soviet Union and mainland China, and that, uh, like France, there seems to be no reason why uh, we need a military force in West Germany, which is now one of the very powerful military nations in the world. We think that there's merit in our retaining a political role in NATO because it's just possible and certainly we hope it will be true, that NATO and the Warsaw Pact nations may be the two foci that can come together in working out some detente in Central Europe, something along the line of the Ripazzi uh, plan. Certainly sometime or other, there must be a peace settlement in Germany, there must be a settlement of the Berlin question, and if it's going to be done, it's more likely to be done by two groups of nations meeting rather than individual nations trying to work out a solution. And for that reason, we think that we should withdraw from, it, from the military role, but that there is a political role uh, which Canada could play. Monsieur Cahouet. Uh, Here is our position. We are in favor of Canada participating as much as possible in the establishment of peace throughout the world. We are decidedly opposed to any military role we might play at this particular time. Oh, 20, for 23 years now, the Second World War has been over, and we are still spending millions and millions of dollars to participate militarily in an organization which is called NATO. I believe that even among military experts, there is no definite agreement. Some military experts are in favor of maintaining or Canadian participation in NATO, and there are other military experts who don't want to hear of it. I think that Canada, according to its own means, should place all its means at the disposal of peace in the world. If there is any game of peace to be, or any role of peace to be played within NATO, it would be normal for us to play it. From a military point of view, let's stop spending millions for bombs and uh, weapons of destruction, and let's rather give bread and butter to those who are hungry throughout the world. When Mr. St. Laurent's government helped to set up NATO 19 years ago, it was a time when European economies and European military might were crushed. And at that time, it was necessary to participate in NATO, indeed to help create it, and as we did in Canada, because at that time we needed a presence, a strong military presence, to prevent the overrunning of Europe by the Soviet forces, which was then the menace as the Cold War developed. Since then, this has changed. The, so the Soviet economies have calmed down a little. The Western Europe countries have become strengthened. And I feel, and I, it's been my policy all along, I haven't changed on that, I feel that we must shift the emphasis now of Canada's participation from the military to the cultural, political, and economic relations with Western Europe and indeed with other parts of Europe. I feel that we must now reassess our military participation in the defense of the free world, and I feel that this should be done by, uh, as I say, shifting the emphasis from Canadian military presence in Europe to uh, presence in areas of continental defense. Une question de Ron Collister à M. Douglas. Mr. Douglas, some regions of Canada are poorer than others, and all leaders have promised to attack this inequality. Well, who pays? And are you prepared to go on record tonight that you will meet this problem without raising taxes? 
I would say we will meet the problem. I don't think anyone can guarantee that you can do it without raising taxes. Although I think there's a very strong possibility that it can be done without raising taxes. The Economic Council of Canada says that every time we reduce unemployment by one percentage point, we increase the total output of the nation by some two billion dollars. And a third of this finds its way into the government coffers. If we could reduce our unemployment even by one and a half percentage points, this would increase our total wealth output by three billion dollars and put another billion dollars in the government treasury. So that I think the attack on the slowing down of the economy is the number one problem that faces government. I'm convinced that with relatively full employment, even taking 3% as being acceptable, which many countries in Europe wouldn't accept, that even with 3% unemployment, we would greatly increase our wealth production and we would greatly increase our revenues without any increase in present taxes. Also, uh, if we were to uh, reduce our military commitments in Europe under NATO, uh, if we were to withdraw from uh, NORAD, which is costing us uh, some $140 million a year, uh, if we were to implement some of the recommendations of the Auditor General, uh, where every indication is that we could save tens of millions of dollars, by removing some of the administrative waste, I think it is possible to help the underdeveloped areas of this country without raising taxes. But I want to say this, that if I had to choose between raising taxes and not helping the underdeveloped areas, I would help raise the standard of living in those underdeveloped countries or areas. Monsieur Kawad, votre réplique. Uh, voici. Everyone recognizes that, that there are some regions which are poorer than others in Canada. And in times of a, the election campaign, we hear the Prime Minister say that there will be representatives from all those regions after the election in order to try and solve the problem. We did not at all need a general election in order to start solving this these problems. The Prime Minister and the government could have very easily presented a program designed to improve economic conditions in the so-called underdeveloped areas. Now, this applies to all Canadians. We ask the workers in these regions, just as in all other regions, to make sacrifices and not to ask for wage increases, not to ask for a better price for, for farm products, for instance, and the rest. And on the other hand, the same government asking the workers and the farmers to make sacrifices allows the financiers to increase in interest rates up to 10 and 15 percent. This is the first disparity. This is the first economic inequality in Canada. If the purchasing power were to be distributed to the Canadian people who are building Canada, then Canadian products would, would take their normal course and the Canadian industry would be strengthened everywhere, including the Maritimes. Monsieur Trudeau. Well, the correction of regional disparities, that is, uh, in those uh, of those areas who are not as wealthy as the others is a matter of great priority. It is not fair to say we have waited until the elections to talk about that. We have a great many of programs which are designed to correct these inequalities. I might uh, talk of ARDA here, which made it possible for us a fortnight ago to sign an agreement under which we gave $212 million for the Lawrence Doris area. There is the FRED program, the Cape Breton Development Corporation. There are all kinds of programs for designated area. There is our great program for the retraining of manpower. All these programs are designed to help those areas which are in an in inferior position at the present time. As far as we are concerned, these are priority matters. We will apply these programs in a coordinated manner. We want to apply them in a more efficient manner also so that they come together, so that they can be concentrated on those areas which are underdeveloped. It might be possible 
to do this without increasing taxes. We might have to increase taxes. I don't know. However, we haven't provided for any increases in our next budget. We feel that these plans can be applied in a far more efficient way than has heretofore been the case, and that they will apply to those regions which need it most. Mr. Stenfield. I don't see why uh, the implementation of this sort of policy should lead to an increase in taxation, because I don't think it involves necessarily large expenditures in national terms. Uh, of course, it was of interest to me that the question of regional disparity wasn't even on the agenda of the of the Federal Provincial Conference in February until the Premier of Nova Scotia asked to be put there. Now, I think there's a, a national interest, an interest in the nation, in seeing that substantial numbers of Canadians in various parts of the country are not un chronically unemployed or chronically underemployed. Now, I don't mean to suggest that uh, one is entitled necessarily to employment uh, in, in his village or in every village in Canada. I think there's a, there's a happy medium. But I do think if we're to have a strong Canada, we need strong regions. And the movement of people has never by itself been sufficient. Uh, I've been accused, of course, of making great promises, this building a tunnel between Newfoundland and Labrador. I did no such thing. I promised an economic feasibility study, a perfectly responsible thing to do. I think that federal development policies should recognize the, the particular potential also of particular areas, and this can help meet the problem of regional disparity. The main thing is to coordinate all the policies of the federal government with the policies of the, of the provinces. This is not a question of money, but coordination there. Une question de Jean-Marc Poliquin à Monsieur Cahouet. Monsieur Cahouet, le 28 mai... Mr. Cahouet, on May 28th, you stated on camera 68, that for the social credit rally, the balance of power in Parliament is more important than power itself. If you were to obtain this balance of power, would you use it in order to block the government or facilitate the adoption of amendments to the criminal code which would allow, in some cases, abortion and, in other cases, homosexuality? Mr. Cowett. I shall be very frank. We would not support the measure or the bill as presented before the House. We wanted it to be divided into sections or by subjects which are, were included in the bill. In the field of homosexuality, for instance, it's clear we will not support the government. I think that the Prime Minister is no longer speaking of this bill anyway. It would create tremendous problems in Canada since a man, a mature man, could in the future marry another mature man. This would create problems for the government for the maintenance of these children who were born of these groups. We would therefore not accept supporting the government in these measures. In the case of abortion, neither, ex with the exception of very specific cases recommended by doctors and so on. However, this is the attitude which the social credit rally is taking at the present time th throughout the area where it is conducting the election campaign. It is not an attitude to denigrate. This is not our object. Our objective is, is to be objective, and we believe that there is a legislation which should be presented to the national parliament, much more important legislation than that you have just mentioned. That is why we would ask the government to withdraw the bill and to introduce legislation of a nature to allow Canadian citizens, first of all, to live here in their own country. I think we don't quite agree. Eh? The bill doesn't deal with homosexuality. It speaks of gross indecency and... The present criminal code doesn't speak of homosexuality in its present form, but of gross indecency. It is at present a crime in Canada for two adults, a man and wife, a man or his little girlfriend, or two women or two men together. It is a crime to commit gross indecency, unnatural acts. All we have said in the amendment of the criminal code proposed by us is that what goes on in private between two consenting adults, whether it be a man or a woman or two men or two women, is their own business. It isn't the police's visit. It is the business of the confessor, the business of the religious 
conviction, so to speak, but it doesn't concern the police. We are not authorizing homosexuality. We are simply saying we are not going to publish. We are not going to send policemen into the nation's bedroom to see what goes on between two adults over the age of 21. That is all there is to it. We are separating the idea of sin and the idea of crime. As far as abortion is concerned, all we are doing is clarifying the act as it is. Uh, so, some things are going down in hospitals at the present time, including Catholic hospitals. We are saying simply that abortion under certain conditions to save the mother's life for instance, will be allowed with the permission of a committee. The only thing is that we are creating a committee which did not exist before. We are improving the act. We are not making abortion any easier. I would want to see the, the bill divided. I think it should be because it includes... Uh, such a variety of subjects, everything from the control, of, not everything, but a number of items running from the control of firearms uh, through uh, tests relating to safety measures on the highway, which I very much approve, incidentally, uh, homosexuality and abortion. Now, the abortion legislation, abortion aspect, uh, is a very difficult matter for the, apparently, for the religious principles of a good many Canadians. And uh, while I certainly regard the subject of abortion as a proper subject for Parliament to consider, uh, I think that in view of the conscientious and religious difficulty that uh, a good many Canadians have and members of the House would have, I think it should be a, a, a free vote. I also understand that the committee that's been considering the bill has had a good deal of difficulty uh, concerning lack of information, authoritative information about abortion and abortion uh, legislation. But uh, I would want to see the, the bill uh, divided, as I say, a f proper subject for Parliament and a free vote. Mr. Douglas. I take it the question has to do only with the parts of the bill which refer to legalized abortion and homosexuality. And certainly if those measures were brought before the House, we would support them. Those measures were incorporated in Bill C-195 as the result of uh, prolonged discussions by an all-party committee of the House. Representations were made by church groups, social workers, medical men, uh, and people in all walks of life. And it was felt that uh, our legislation in Canada was antiquated, that we ought to make provision for legalized abortion, uh, under strict supervision and under certain conditions. And that persons who objected to it, of course, and persons who have moral conscience against it, need not avail themselves of it, but that we had no right to take what some may consider to be a moral wrong and make it a crime. And the same thing is true with homosexuality. What we're really saying is that you must distinguish between sin and crime. And uh, if ever we needed in this country to adopt a new attitude to homosexuality, th this is the time. Uh, instead of treating it as a crime and driving it underground, we ought to recognize it for what it is. It's a, it's a mental illness. It's a psychiatric condition which ought to be treated sympathetically, which ought to be treated by psychiatrists and social workers. And we're not going to do this by throwing people into jail. La dernière question de ce débat sera posée. The last question of this debate will be put to Mr. Trudeau by Ron Collister. Five or six years ago, the Glasgow Commission showed how government could save money. Since then, the cost of government administration has risen from one billion, which, as it was then, to 1.6 billion, and there are now 40,000 more people on the work rolls. What would your government do to cut costs, and specifically, what more will you do to implement the remaining one third of the Glasgow proposals? Well, to cut the cost, we have already put a freeze on the civil service. We are not expanding it. Uh, we have also cut some 50 items from the uh, estimates. We are curtailing governmental expense. Uh, but there again, must, one must keep the sense of proportion. The federal government civil service has expanded less, and its budget has expanded less than the gross national product, than the number of uh, civil servants working for large corporations for the private sector. The government has to remain at least as efficient as the private sector. We are curtailing our growth, uh, in other words, but we're not stopping completely to, to, to service the public. 
Now, as far as the Glasgow recommendations are concerned, uh, many departments have already implemented all its recommendations. Uh, every year, uh, we, we, uh, we do review them and we see how many are left, and there has been steady progress, and uh, we will continue implementing all these uh, recommendations which can be implemented, and indeed we've done many other things to make government more efficient. Votre réplique, Monsieur Stanfield. Yes, Your certainly. Mr. Stanfield. Implement the recommendations of the Glasgow Commission and also those of the Auditor General, which the Liberal government apparently has been slow to accept from time to time. Uh, of course, government practices should be subjected to constant review of the sort uh, furnished by the Glasgow Commission. Uh, because conditions change and uh, it's necessary to subject procedures to constant uh, scrutiny. Uh, the big thing, however, is to exercise control over new programs. And it's interesting to me that with all the talk about restraint on the part of the government, uh, the government insisted on proceeding with a form of, of a Medicare program, for example, which eight of the ten provinces said they didn't want, either because they objected to it in principle or because they said they couldn't afford it. Now, I want to see a Medicare plan made available uh, to all Canadians. But in 1966, uh, the Liberal government said the conditions in the country call for the Medicare program being deferred. Surely the difficulties in the economy are even greater now. And yet, uh, when the crunch came, the, uh, the plan was proceeded with despite the objections of the provinces. And, very heavy new commitments made. Mr. Douglas. Well, certainly I don't think the recommendations of the Glasgow Commission have been uh, implemented with any degree of commendable rapidity. I think, in fact, I think there's been a good deal of hesitation and foot dragging. I think even worse is the fact that last year the Auditor General brought down 86 recommendations for what he considered uh, wasteful extravagance and the uh, expenditures committee of the House of Commons went over those recommendations and were not able to find that any remedial action had been taken with reference to these matters. I, I think that the uh, problem is an administrative one. I think that the government needs to set up within the uh, Treasury Board organization the equivalent of a, um, a, a, a Treasury uh, Budget Bureau that would constantly uh, assess programs, uh, just as the Auditor General checks programs for expenditures, would check programs to see whether or not they're, they continue to be necessary, to see whether or not they continue to require the amount of staff that they need, needed when the program was at its peak. I'm convinced that just setting up a commission uh, back in 1962 or 3 uh, isn't going to solve your problem now. You need a constant and continuous audit to, to, to cut out the fat and to, and to reduce uh, unnecessary expenditures that are bound to grow up in any bureaucracy. Monsieur Cahouet. It is clear that cuts in government expenditures are required in some areas of some sectors of the administration. However, when you have reached the point where you are cutting expenditures, for instance, for the construction of buildings that we need, where we have the materials, we have the men, the contractors, and so on, when there are refusals for increases in pensions, not because we lack any products, but because we are in financial difficulty, when federal projects are postponed and left set aside strictly because we are lacking in financial assistance, and then when we allow the government of Canada to pay on national debt, the debt only, one billion, four hundred and sixty million, that's sacred. No one can touch it. But to give pensions to the aged, to those who are sick or infirm, who must be content with sixty, seventy, seventy-five dollars per month, oh, we can't raise that. We can't increase them, even if the cost of living is increasing. This is what we do not accept, that cuts be made in extravagances, yes, fine, but in the field of social legislation, and particularly in the sphere of interest to financiers, yes, I accept cuts, but not in the field of social legislation, construction, or federal projects, 
of a nature to help the population as a whole, to make it financially possible to achieve what is physically desirable Canada can do. Le moment est maintenant venu de conclure. Time has now come to bring this broadcast to an end. You therefore, gentlemen, have one minute and a half each. We will start with Mr. Trudeau. Eh bien, je pense que tous les hommes politiques sont intéressés à travailler pour la prospérité. People in public life, politicians are interested in working for the prosperity of Canada and for the complete freedom of individuals in all those areas where they can realize their personal possibilities to the maximum possible degree. I think that objective can be reached if all Canadians accept to work together. I believe that this country has a great future on condition, however, that we all work towards that purpose. Canadians is to participate in this great future. We are asking them to communicate through their members of parliament with the nerve center of government in Ottawa. We are asking them to participate in every aspect of public life. I, re I respect the decision that the people of Canada will take on the 25th of June. I respect the decision as one which will be good for the country, but I do ask the people of Canada to give our party a good, strong mandate on June 25th. Mr. Stenfield. We stand for uh, better government in Canada. We recognize the need for reform of many aspects of Canadian life. We're anxious to see a Medicare program adopted that the provinces are able to proceed with. We want to uh, restore, improve the condition of the poor and the unemployed. We recognize the challenge to Canada in uh, strengthening our great agricultural industry, and we propose to establish, with the, with the support of the people of Canada, a government of energy and talent joining men of proven experience. We will pursue our great task of reconciliation based on faith and mutual confidence in one Canada. To this, we will bring neither hostility nor prejudice, but base our proceedings on tolerance and understanding and goodwill, which must be the basis of any, any discussion leading to actual progress. Enfin, nous offrons au peuple canadien... We are offering the Canadian people an alternative to the present government. An alternative in terms of politics, men, and principles. And I believe that this is what Canadians want to give to our Canadian life, stability, harmony, and confidence. Mr. Douglas. Uh, two weeks from Tuesday, the people of Canada will be going to the polls. And I think that between now and then, they have a right to some answers. They have a right to know what the political parties are going to do about the problems of unemployment and rising living costs and the inadequate housing. What the parties are going to do about getting our economy moving again. And whether uh, we use Mr. Trudeau's phrase that we're going through an adjustment or Mr. Sharp's phrase that we're creating a little slack in the economy, the fact is that our economy is not moving and it's not providing jobs. And all over this country tonight, there are thousands of university students who can't get summer work. I think the people of Canada have a right to know what our position is, and I don't think they should be asked to be satisfied with vague generalities and meaningless slogans. As far as the New Democratic Party is concerned, we commit ourselves. We say we will implement the recommendations of the Carter Report and of the Watkins Report, that we are prepared to set up a prices review board and ask the provinces for concurrent legislation that will enable us to stop this runaway inflation. We say we are prepared to do something about high interest rates and to see that homes are built at prices that people can afford to pay. And I hope that between now and Election Day, the people will listen to the answers given by the various political parties and vote according to what they think will be best for them and their loved ones. Mr. Kawad, your conclusion. Uh, in hearing the representatives of the three political parties who have just spoken, they, the three, are proposing changes, reforms in taxation, 
But none of them is speaking of monetary reform. And this is precisely the point. This is where the nervous center of the entire structure, economic structure of Canada lies, the monetary structure. Even if we change the taxation, the right to tax one more than another, or another first more than the first, changes nothing. We are continuing to be eternally exploited. What the people are asking for, what you are all asking for, men, women, young people, is to have your security with freedom. Now, the, the creditists for 30 or 35 years have been speaking of monetary reform. More and more, the economists and particularly politicians are incapable of denying the found the found very foundation of our principles, and that's why on June 25th I ask you to vote for the social credit member in your writing. Monsieur, je vous remercie beaucoup. Gentlemen, I thank you. Les candidats expriment leurs remerciements aux nombreuses stations de radio. Express their thanks to the large number of radio and TV stations which have provided them with an opportunity of being heard. The CTV. Uh, the French and English networks of the CBC thank the party leaders for having accepted this invitation. The largest network of radio and television ever assembled in Canada and has been carried around the world by the CBC International Service. This national debate has come to you live and in color from Confederation Hall in the West Block of the Parliament buildings in Ottawa. Good night. Bonsoir.